Zebra. Uh, we greet you today in the frameworks of uh, project City as a Classroom. So, I prepare uh, some questions for interview and we can start. You are a prominent representative of the new school of uh, classical architecture. Why do you think uh, this is a direction is more promising compared to, uh, let's say, a new way uh, modernist style? That is a very good question because it is probably evident to many people that um, like with many aspects of modern society, there seem to be opposing camps in architecture as well. Um, those who believe that we should forge ahead, be innovative, original, um, not look back and uh, try to produce um, new work all the time, um, especially reflective uh, perhaps of the diversity and sometimes chaos of our time. Uh, and those who believe that there is um, uh, that there are many uh, qualities, characteristics, and benefits of continuing um, the uh, historic uh, professional knowledge that we have uh, through uh, continuing traditional and cl uh, including classical uh, approaches to architecture. Um, so from my perspective, I'm very much aware of those two directions. Uh, I'm very much aware that they often don't speak to each other. Uh, they just assume that there's nothing to be gained um, from each other. Uh, but in my opinion, this is one large world of architecture, um, which is a unified effort or should be a unified effort to um, make a built environment that is um, socially, environmentally, and uh, economically viable and benefits the people who in, and creatures and the nature um, that inhabits it. Um, and so I'm much more interested in understanding that continuity um, uh, as um, uh, rather than focusing on the differences. That said, however, um, I have spent a good amount of time in practice and in teaching, um, uh, advancing the ideas uh, of that of the continuing of traditional knowledge. And uh, there are many reasons for that, but perhaps we should go on with other questions to not spend too much time on one answer. How do you think uh, classical and uh, modern architecture affects uh, the science? psychological state of the people? Well, you know, I think uh, buildings, the built environment, architecture, landscape, uh, anything, any human intervention in our natural or built environment um, does have a large impact on the human beings in it. Um, and uh, many people are aware of what those impacts are uh, on themselves individually. Uh, you know, or there's even a study, um, you know, of behavior in various kinds of environment. Um, but I think um, different people react in different ways. So um, for many people, and I think you see this in um, worldwide tourism, for instance, there is a great draw to visit and be in the older places that represent um, our human civilization growing over many centuries. Uh, and there's a great admiration for the way those places look and feel. And um, uh, very often people will choose to live in those places because they are still very wonderful. Um, they speak to, I'm thinking of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the small medieval uh, village in, uh, a European, uh, in the European countryside or the historic center of um, uh, a city. Um, I've been to some of your cities like uh, St. Petersburg and um, uh, find them fascinating um, for what they reflect um, about the history, but also uh, the great efforts to make them beautiful and comfortable for the people who, live, who lived in them then and who, uh, of course, live in them now uh, in a different way, but still finding great benefit 
in being there. Otherwise, they would leave uh, if it was not. So, um, uh, you know, uh, we live in a time in which many people can make choices and um, in where they can, they choose between the clean, um, a simple, unencumbered um, lines of a modern apartment where you leave other lives behind, you start a whole new life, um, you can minimize your attachment to things and so on, um, or those people who would rather be in an atmosphere. Um, I look at your background and I see uh, framed um, photographs on the wall and various kinds of um, uh, elements that are probably have a history to them. Uh, and that can be very meaningful, those kinds of connections with um, prior generations. Uh, you know, I think one of the important things that architecture uh, uh, and historical elements represent for us are a connection and a recognition of those people who enabled us to have the life that we're having today um, because of their efforts, uh, either through building or the arts or scientific innovation or political commitments. Um, you know, we, whatever we do stands on the shoulders of our predecessors. And so there's a bit of hubris in saying uh, history doesn't matter and uh, we have all the tools we need today to have uh, to advance and have a wonderful society. Um, and I, I think we're learning a little bit about that hubris now in the pandemic. Um, many decades thinking that um, uh, life was quite wonderful and that the, we were in charge and we were in control. Um, but uh, we're beginning to understand that we're part of a longer history um, in which there are moments in which we are not in control. Um, or in less control than um, we think we are. You introduced a unique concept uh, such as a smart code into the urban field uh, based on which uh, there were many cities built. Uh, how did this affect people's life and uh, what are the rules, results of opinion polls? It's important to understand that the smart code uh, is a zoning code. Um, it's a, a, a municipal regulation to control um, private building and, and also to formulate uh, public, especially so in order to formulate a specific public spaces, the public spaces that we share, um, uh, which are our social spaces. So. Um, uh, the smart code was developed in the last couple of decades by the new urbanists, a movement called the new urbanism, which started out being a, a, a reaction, um, a critique and a reaction to suburban sprawl, to American suburban sprawl, which of course has uh, become global suburban sprawl, um, the way cities have been expanding um, uh, to some degree mindlessly. Uh, and all the problems that came with those, uh, the social segregation of uh, uh, wealthy and more modestly um, endowed people, um, the environmental impacts of spreading out so much, the, the amount of utilities, uh, of resources that we use and so on. So um, we understood the new urbanists. I was a co-founder of the Congress for the New Urbanism, cnu.org. Uh, uh, which uh, continues as a, a viable group of um, many different disciplines, architects, developers, attorneys, landscape architects, um, elected officials, uh, who are interested in making the built environment uh, a better place for people and for um, our natural environment. Uh, and we understood at the outset that there needed to be large uh, changes to how we develop cities. Uh, and, uh, and that's a whole other seminar. Uh, <laughs> um, but we understood that those changes come through education, um, people understanding what the ideas are, but also policy, um, the kinds of rules that uh, establish that kind of growth um, or establish how cities grow because suburban sprawl was a result of rules. 
Um, and so uh, the SMART code is that attempt uh, to give people a template, a kind of uh, pattern uh, for how to regulate building um, for environmental responsibility, uh, social integration, and, and economic sustainability. Um, uh, it's, it's very pragmatic. Uh, and yes, as, you, as your question pointed out, it's being used um, uh, in many parts uh, of the world, including um, it's been recently translated into Polish. So you could um, uh, see it in a language that's closer to yours. Um, uh, but if anyone is interested in it, um, I'd be happy to receive an email asking for a copy and I would um, send an electronic link. You are creator of a method of integrated master plans with a specific project design uh, regulation has been implemented uh, on almost all continents except Antarctica. Uh, how could you describe uh, the influence of mentality of the region on the way cities develop? Um, yes, my firm, uh, uh, DPZ, Duani Platter Zeberg, uh, and also um, my work at the University of Miami, uh, the School of Architecture, where I'm in the Director of Urban Design program currently, um, has spent a long time on um, uh, helping to create new communities and also helping existing communities to reform uh, themselves as needed um, through design, um, as you mentioned, through the codes um, in our prior question about the smart code. Uh, and through um, engagement with the public, with the residents uh, and stakeholders of any place uh, to help these ideas be implemented. Um, I think it's important to understand that um, these are not individual artistic efforts to say you must live the way I drew the plan, um, but they follow certain principles of, um, uh, of goal, uh, certain goals and principles that are, that have been um, agreed upon, let's say, in the last several decades. Um, 27 of those principles can be seen in the, in the charter for the new urbanism, uh, which can be read on the um, uh, Congress for the New Urbanism website. That also has been translated into many languages, including Mandarin, but um, I must say I don't remember whether it's been translated into Russian or not. Yeah. But um, at any rate, um, these new communities began with, uh, well, there's a history of new community design and building throughout the world, you know, the kind of utopian visions for better ways to live. Uh, and uh, I think when we began in the 1970s and 1980s with a project called Seaside, uh, which is in the North Florida the coast uh, facing the Gulf of Mexico, um, now joined by several other new towns in the region, such as um, Alice Beach, Rosemary Beach. Um, uh, these were modeled on traditional urbanism, um, uh, streets and blocks, buildings facing um, the street with front doors, um, porches, um, a, a kind of fine-grained mix of uses so you could walk to everything you need. Um, you know, the way we've always built cities when people walked instead of depending on their automobiles. Uh, and, but that hadn't been done for many decades since before World War II, really. Um, uh, or even, yeah, really in the 1920s in the progressive era was the last time that this was done in the U.S., for instance. And so Seaside had a tremendous impact uh, because it was, many architects participated in the buildings. We didn't design any of the buildings. We designed the master plan and we wrote the code uh, and then um, many a diverse um, uh, a diversity of owners property purchasers and owners uh, the central developer and many architects and builders contributed to making a place of great charm uh, that has become a, a kind of a child a poster child we say a, a, an, an example 
which when people visit, they immediately understand um, what, what the goals are and what the benefits are. So um, yes, we, we're lucky to have had, um, let's say 30 or 40 years of being able to work on projects like this that now present um, a quite an extensive cadre of examples for people to look to. Um, there may be a big, we may be entering a large interruption um, of these kinds of efforts now, we don't know. Um, but I think we're all privileged to be able to have these um, places already existing, which will serve as models in the future, much as we were looking at traditional models um, back in 19, in the 70s and 80s, um, uh, which were the teachers, that tradition was the teachers for what we did for the next 30 years. I think the last my question is, what recommendation could you give to influential developers, co-designers, uh, the current pandemic situation, which has significant affected all sphere of life? Uh, yes, so, you know, I think we don't know yet, we have not learned yet everything there is to be learned from this situation and it's still evolving. Um, but in the uh, four months or so that we've been um, involved with um, isolation in our homes, in our apartments, and um, um, social distancing, not being able to be with uh, friends, um, uh, and for many people, unfortunately, not being able to go to work. Um, I think we've come to understand at least one thing, which is that the public spaces of the city are very important um, for everyone, because those are the places in which you can go out of your apartment or house. It's probably most critical if you live in an apartment and, you're, and your space is restricted. We, understand that the smaller footprint we have, the better for the earth. Um, but that's, that's totally predicated on the idea that there are other places that we can be in as well. And so those public spaces um, need to accommodate us as um, pedestrians, as people moving around among other people, um, not just in vehicles. Um, and so uh, making those spaces more pedestrian friendly um, is critical. Many cities in the U.S. Uh, and uh, I know in various other parts of the world have, um, with the diminishment of vehicular traffic because people are not going to work or school, uh, have uh, made broader pedestrian spaces in streets. They put planters in the middle of the street so the restaurants could have the tables outside or so people could walk and bicycle in places that they couldn't before. Uh, and so that's true for parks as well, is understanding that they, there probably needs to be more space available for people to move around um, without automobiles, um, on foot, on bicycles, um, with baby carriages, you know, with a person in a wheelchair, uh, all of the ways that we want to be uh, outside of our apartments. Um, uh, and this is an opportunity to think about remaking those places. Um, do you know we probably, a certain number of people will continue to work remotely and not be going, not commuting to work every day. Um, uh, maybe we will benefit by having less traffic in the future. Um, uh, but even if if we get back to normal, I think we've understood what the benefits are of having that open space dedicated for the pedestrian, and um, we could make those changes permanent. Um, and then, of course, there are various ways that uh, building designs could alter as well. And um, we probably need to learn a little bit more about um, how these creatures, these viruses, interact with surfaces before we make um, 
uh, start making large changes to buildings. But I think we understand that that being able to get out and be among people um, safely um, is important for our mental health and our physical health to be able to get exercise and, and so on. And, and the city represents those opportunities. They may not be fully um, present the way we devoted so much of the built environment to automobiles, but um, we, can, we can make those improvements. Thank you. Uh, so my uh, my intuition is finished. Maybe uh, you want anything added from your opinion. Uh, well, thank you very much for this opportunity to speak to an audience that um, I don't know. Um, uh, but I should say that um, the Congress for the New Urbanism um, can be a great resource for uh, of information and even entertainment. Um, for people who may be um, trying to use this opportunity to learn more about cities mm -hmm. and how to get involved in um, helping to make cities better. Uh, and there are, in fact, I'm sure um, in every country that might uh, have an audience here, um, such organizations. Um, so, you know, I encourage people to get involved with their own city. Um, to make it um, a better place and um, to make it a better place for people, uh, not just machines and investors, but the people who use these places. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, what is the, uh, which city in Europe maybe you like um, best of all? Maybe one of these all? Oh, you know, uh, I'm often asked that. And I have to say, it's, um, they're not my children, but it's like asking who's your favorite child. <laughs> um, I think every city has um, uh, remarkable spaces and uh, probably more often than not, I would point to um, some historic place in the city, but um, there have been some uh, very noble efforts to make new places. Um, as well uh, in existing cities. So, uh, you know, I think um, I would certainly point to places that I admired in St. Petersburg. Uh, I love certain parts of um, Warszawa and Krakow. Um, and even in Vilnius, um, there's a, a, a charming, you know, this, this issue of um, traditional versus modern. If you go even to a, a smaller city like Vilnius and you see there's a medieval core and then there's an 18th and 19th century section that's equivalently beautiful and there it is side by side. Um, and what an enrichment that is to have both of those. And so, um, but the most important thing is that they're not all mixed up. They kind of each represent their own character you will it's like people you allow everyone their own personality and uh, you don't expect everyone to do everything you bring them together with their own, each with their strengths so if we were to think of um, the not taking apart the historic city by with modern architecture but making the new using that modern architecture to make new places and conserving the old places um, um, they won't be merely museums. They are viable places for people to enjoy living and working in. Um, and as an ensemble, that kind of history um, next to each other uh, is an incredible, uh, I think, enrichment of life. Um, in our hemisphere, Havana uh, displays, the, uh, it's done a very good job of preservation, perhaps because of um, a lack of economic opportunity, um, but certainly the, the ages of its development are very clearly displayed in a very interesting way. So I think every city can, can imagine itself in that way.